Hey there, everyone. Welcome to another Chem Complete episode. And on today's episode, I want to talk about conservation of mass and the proportion laws. So these are subjects or principles that we learn early in general chemistry, even high school chemistry, um, that refers to matter, mass, atoms, and how compounds are to be constructed in the natural environment. So in order to get a full understanding of this, we want to first take a look at uh, Dalton and his atomic theory. So John Dalton came up with the atomic theory. Now there were people before him um, back in ancient Greece and so forth, the philosophers that proposed ideas behind um, strong indivisible molecules that make up everything that we see on this plane. In other words, referencing atoms. But uh, John Dalton really put together the first formal atomic theory. There were flaws in it. Uh, specifically about atoms being the smallest particle. We know there's protons, neutrons, electrons, and even after that we have quarks and other smaller uh, particles. However, he had the general um, consensus right in terms of what he put. So there are four points that John Dalton outlined. The first one is that elements are composed of small particles called atoms. And that's the important principle in that one. Uh, we just mentioned the indivisible stuff. All atoms of a given element are identical. The atoms from one element are different from that of another. So if we look at the periodic table, that is to say hydrogen is different from helium, is different from carbon, is different from iron, right? Those specific elements, if we have just one mono element, that the structure of the atoms, the protons, the electrons, the way that those are configured, are going to have to be unique and different from any other element on the table. Otherwise, we would have a problem where we couldn't distinguish between them. Okay, now number three, compounds are composed of atoms of more than one element. All compounds must contain elements in whole integer set format. So this is really going to reference the proportion laws, the definite and the multiple proportions, which we will discuss in a few minutes. That comes from point three of Dalton's theory. And then point four uh, is a chemical reaction involves rearrangement of atoms, but never the destruction or the creation of atoms. So in other words, we cannot destroy or create mass. We can only transform it or rearrange it through reactions or changes in physical state. Now, I do want to mention for those of you that might have some higher knowledge or uh, have been informed of some physics background <clears throat> that when we are discussing this, you can have a transfer into energy. So energy and mass do share a relationship and you can have some mass that is converted into energy in specific uh, scenarios. However, in general, for most of the general reactions we look at, we're going to have a conservation of mass. We're not going to consider uh, slippage into the energy format, uh, at least while we're looking at this. So let's talk about the conservation of mass. The conservation of mass is that matter cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transformed or rearranged, and this comes from Dalton's fourth point that we had. So consider an example. Let's say that we're burning a log. So you have the log, and then you set the log on fire. Now, the log originally is made up of some organic material that's allowed to burn in the presence of oxygen. Okay, so when you finish with the log and you collect the ashes of what remains, you're going to find that the ashes are going to have a smaller mass than the log. So the question is what happens since we're not allowed to have destruction of matter. And what happens is that as you're burning, you are giving off byproducts as gases. So you have carbon monoxide, you have car especially carbon dioxide, you have water vapor. These are all going to escape into the environment as the log is being burned. And then you have the residual ash material that's left over and that would be added to this. So if we could do this in some sort of a chamber and capture all of the gases that are being burnt off and then weigh the mass of the chamber before and after the combustion, now there would have to be some oxygen in the chamber to allow for proper burning. Um, in that case, we should be able to see that the mass stays consistent before and after. Okay, and mass is not the only thing that's conserved. There is a conservation of energy which gets into the laws of thermodynamics, but Again, mass and energy are connected, so we do not have a destruction or creation of mass or energy. We can only transform back and forth and manipulate it 
through these types of chemical reactions. So that is the conservation of mass and that is addressed in Dalton's fourth point. Now with his third point we started to talk about the proportions. So there's a law of definite proportions and then there is a law of multiple proportions. Now the law of definite proportions states that different samples of the same compound always contain elements in the same mass proportion. So let's take water as an example here. If we look at H2O and we consider the mass of H2O from the periodic table, the hydrogen is going to weigh 1.01 each and there's two of them so it would be 2.02. .02. The total mass of water would be 18.02 .02, and that's because oxygen is going to be 16 which is the remaining portion. So you want to divide each of these respectively into the mass of water and for hydrogen you find that it is approximately with rounding 11.2 percent hydrogen by mass and it is 88.8 percent oxygen by mass. This will not change. That is why it's called the law of definite proportions. It means that anytime we're dealing with water, any sample of water you take, you can take a hundred different samples, a thousand, a million different samples. When you break it down, if it is just truly water, it will always be 11.2% hydrogen and 88.8% oxygen by definition. It has to be. Okay? If it were something else, it would be a different compound. So for instance, when we have H2O2, you have the same exact elements and atoms that are present here, but you have a different ratio of them. So the mass for H2O2 is going to be 34.02 because we have to add 16 for another oxygen. So hydrogen is going to be, again, only two of them, 2.02 .02 divided by 34.02. .02. The oxygen is going to be 32 divided by 34.02. .02. Again, this is larger this time because we have two oxygens. The approximate percentages rounded off here are 5.94% and 94.06%. Because we added oxygen, you can see that there is a greater proportion that is due to oxygen in the hydrogen peroxide than there was in the water. And by definition, even though it's the same elements as water, hydrogen peroxide will always be 5.94% hydrogen and 94.06% oxygen, again, with some rounding given there. All right. So that is the law of definite proportions. It says that when you have samples of the same compound, they will always contain the same elements in the same mass proportion. So then what is the law of multiple proportions, which is also being referenced in Dalton's third law? The law of multiple proportions states if two elements can combine to make compounds, they must combine in ratios of whole integer atoms. And when we take a look at this, it could be more than two. It could be three, four, but when you start combining them, they have to combine in whole integer numbers. So that is to say, if we look at something like H2O, we see that it's two hydrogens and one oxygen. If we look at hydrogen peroxide, it is two hydrogens and two oxygens. These are whole integers each time that we're doing it. If we look at the hydroxide ion, it is going to be one oxygen and one hydrogen. Okay, now the one is implied, it's not written here. The appearance of that element in the first place is what gives us the one. However, if we were to look at something, we could not say we have 1.5 hydrogens and one oxygen. This is not allowed with the law of multiple proportions because it would be suggesting that you can fractionate an atom or element and it does come as a basic unit. It would not be appropriate to write something like H2O 1.66. You have to have whole units. So it's fine to have H2O2, H2O, or OH, but they have to be set and defined in these multiple proportions that are going to be whole integers when we see them. Now, I just want to make a brief note. Some people get confused when we're determining empirical formulas and molecular formulas because you come up with something like this. But remember, when you're doing that, the rule towards the end of solving those problems says that you have to multiply 
by a whole number in order to get the nearest set of whole integers. Okay, so for instance, you would have to multiply by 3 or by 2 or whatever it might be in that case that evens it out so that you get whole integers in examples like that. They do not allow you to remain in this state. All right, so that's it. That covers the law of definite and multiple proportions as well as the conservation of mass and how they relate back to Dalton's atomic theory. So hopefully these general chemistry principles are a little bit more clear now. Um, if you enjoyed the video, you found it helpful, go ahead and leave us a like. And if you comment, if you have questions you'd like to see answered on the channel, we always take user requests. We appreciate all the support that you guys have shown us. And if you remember to subscribe, you'll be up to date throughout the semester with all of our most relevant content. And if you get a chance, head on over to chemcomplete.com, chemcomplete.com which is our channel. We have lots of free general chemistry resources on the site. We also have guides available for purchase at $5 each that go through very, very detailed walkthroughs of specific content and give practice problems. And we also have available one-on-one -on -one services like tutoring and mentoring. So other than that, thanks for learning with us, and I hope you guys have a great rest of the day.